And we are indeed live and uh, excited and happy to be here this evening. Um, good evening, Flagstaff, our LBE uh, family and supporters and viewers, wherever you are, Flagstaff and uh, all around the world. And um, today we're here at the kitchen table um, with some of our sisters, and, and we have some hot things that we want to touch on this evening, and so I don't want to uh, delay. Sister Kara, please tell us, why are we here? Yes, good evening to everyone who's joining us. We have several topics to talk about tonight. We have the Oscar Awards and what we are calling the Will Smith Slapgate. We have uh, the, the terms under which violence against Black women is considered acceptable by society and why that is. We have the confirmation of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson and why that has been such a, that is its own or has been its own form of violence against her. <laughs> as a highly qualified woman seeking uh, this appointment, being verbally attacked, um, despite being acknowledged as highly, if not overqualified for that position. So we have a lot of things to talk about. I am uh, glad to be here with one of our frequent guests at the kitchen table, Dr. Ann Hart. Uh, Dr. Hart, could you just take a moment and uh, introduce yourself? Absolutely. I would like to say, first of all, thank you, uh, Ms. Cara House, for inviting me back to Kitchen Table Talk. I really appreciate it. And Reverend Bernadine Lewis, thank you so much. I love you and happy, happy birthday to you. I'm a strategic engagement advocate. I'm a woman of faith for the journey. I'm an educator, writer, and inspirational leader, motivate, motivation um, I motivate, inspire, and encourage you to take a part in initiatives that lead to progression. That's who I am in short. Thank you. Thank you. I know also joining us this evening will be Dr. Tria Allen, and we'll get her in the studio as soon as we are able. Um, but uh, Miss Bernadine, did you want to briefly introduce yourself as well? No, I've been <laughs> here. <laughs> No, Bernadine Lewis and um, one of one of the uh, LBE uh, creators and and um, and so it's just great to be here and to be able to um, have awesome individuals such as um, Dr. Hart, you still as our resident facilitator. <laughs> And um, I'm just excited um, about about um, having this conversation um, yes. with all of us this evening. So thank you. All right. Well, let's uh, let's just jump in. I, I want us to start with, or actually, Dr. Hart, you uh, recommended starting with uh, Slapgate, and I'm sure there is much to say about that, but. Um, do we want to start with just the the nature of the response to what happened? Um, and for anyone who somehow <laughs> has, is not familiar with what we're talking about, um, at the 2022 uh, Oscar Award ceremony, um, shortly before the presentation for Best Documentary, there was an altercation between uh, host Chris Rock or presenter Chris Rock, um, who made a comment about Jada Pinkett Smith. Um, and in reference to her shaved head, um, he referenced her being ready for GI Jane too. And, and in response to that comment, Will Smith came up on stage, um, slipped his wife's name out of his mouth twice. Um, and the response to it has been all over the place, but um, let's just start with that, just the nature of the response. Dr. Hart, what was your reaction to what happened and, and how do you view how it's been responded to? Thank you very much, um, Ms. House, for giving me an opportunity to speak on this. I um, was actually 
in a cozy place on Sunday. And when I saw it live as it happened, initially for a small moment, I thought it was a skit like so many others. But that um, notion, me thinking it was a skit, only lasted for a few minutes. Um, when Will returned to his seat and with the smugness on his, um, the smugness that he carried down the stage with him back to his seat. When I realized it wasn't a skit is when he did the, um, you know, the derogatory marks out of his mouth as he sat next to a, a very highly acclaimed actress, Lupita. And at the time, no one knew what he said, but it didn't take a rocket scientist to read his lips. So I was, I was actually appalled. I am from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I am a Philly girl to heart. I am a fan of Will Smith, always have been. In fact, I just got finished reading his book called Will, which told me a lot more about him than I've ever known. It was a great book. I've read it in three days. It's 407 pages. And um, I have high respect for all of his accomplishments. And because of how he was raised in an abusive household and et cetera, I would encourage people to take a little peep back into his background with that. So I just, it, it took me to another space and place with Will. Now, I will say this, and it's important for me to say personally, I highly respect a man that supports his wife, his woman. I, I, I think that's remarkable. I truly do. The stand up for your man. However, the space and place in which it was done was very inappropriate. And there was um, no one deserves to be blindsided and ambushed in the middle of an Oscar um, environment or whatever environment. I think he should have gone to him, spoke to um, Chris after at the after party, go in the back room, the bathroom, the back alley, wherever, and talk it out. You know, I think that was... Um, lowest of low for Will to do that. Now, what was surprising is that here is a man who's high probability of getting the Oscar nomination. He got the nomination for, for um, King Richard. I mean, he was there with his family, his friends, his wife. Everybody was laid out, ready for the recognition. I mean, he was right there, right at stage, right at runway. If you know this is what you were there for, why would you do anything to create something that's going to take away from that moment. So it's called self-discipline um, and anger. And I don't even think that he was really that upset about it first until he looked over at Jada. I thought it was deplorable. I thought it was inappropriate. Um, his actions were um, very, um, it was unca uh, uncharacteristic of someone who's there to receive all the honors that they've worked for for the last 35, 40 years. In the words of Warren Buffett, it takes 20 years to build up your reputation. It takes five minutes to destroy it. And that's what he did in those five minutes. Um, and I, I just felt bad for Chris Rock, who has um, mother and children, extended family members, who had to see that happen to their dad, to their brother, to their son. I thought it was awful. I want to you know, commend Chris for the way he held it down. Um, the remark didn't match the, the consequences and no woman wants to be disrespected publicly. However, um, it was, he's a comedian. Now, many of you have been to comedy shows. I've been to many and anybody knows if you sit close, not that anybody deserved this, you know, he went off script. Will's behavior was, was, was inappropriate. And I don't, I don't like the fact that someone would ambush someone on their night of, of host presenting at the Oscars. What happens on behind closed doors is another thing. We wouldn't have known if he had said something to rock later. Now there's, there's another angle I want to look at with this. Suppose there had been a woman who slapped another woman. Men, oh, um, men didn't even do anything about it. Um, I was appalled that when his name was called for his recognition for the Oscar, that everybody stood up and clapped. I don't know how you can slap somebody five minutes later or 30 minutes later and you're up getting applauded and getting recognized for an Oscar. That was so um, inconsistent to the behavior at hand. I'm not understanding that. And I know there were many remarks that were made following that, but how do you applaud that kind of action? Here we spend, we have educators that have been involved in these kitchen talks for a long time and moms and others, community leaders. What do we teach our students? OK, sticks and stones may break your bones, but this is not something that deserve for 
to happen in front of anybody other than having a personal conversation with Chris Rock privately and to explain how you felt. And not only that, but not take the opportunity when he had it to apologize. So that's the first part I want to speak to. And I will let, you know, Dr. Allen, perhaps. Hello, Dr. Allen. Yes, Dr. Allen, I don't know if you want to uh, briefly introduce yourself before diving in or if you just want to dive right in. We're just talking right now about that initial response to what happened. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I think that our conversation is completely, we're, we're doing like for me, right? So this is my opinion. And I think what we're doing is a lot of respectability politics, right? Um, you know, we don't believe that things should have happened, that sort of thing. I, under, I, I honestly believe that we are focusing on the wrong thing. And for me, it is looking at Jada. And Jada is the one who is maligned. Jada is the one who is struggling um, with the comments, the comments that were off scripted, the comments that did not receive a well reception um, through the audience, you know, as evidenced by Chris Rock's, oh, it was a good one. It was, th that was a simple one. It was a good one. And what I, <laughs> You know, what I'm constantly going back to is why is it ever okay to malign a Black woman in public? And why do we have to continuously be the, the joke, um, even if he was a comedian? So I hear a lot of things like, it's just hair, or he's, he's a comedian, that's just what comedians do. Well, the just there, for me, dehumanizes what has happened to Jada. Will and Chris getting into it, okay, those, those, are, those are decisions, but I think we've missed the point where we don't look to see what Jada is experiencing. And in that moment, um, you know, everyone was like, oh my gosh, is this real or not? Um, I was actually looking at Jada's face. And then after the Oscars, I tend to take the side of Tiffany Haddish, who was like, I felt protected. I felt loved. I felt like it was an expression of love. And so for me, it's like, yes, we can have opinions about the behavior, but the, the wider spread thing here is for those people who are like, violence isn't the answer. Or those people who are like, women, um, women are making this stuff up. I, I just think there's so much that we're missing. And from a black feminist perspective, um, which is where I'm coming from, nobody in this discourse, everyone is, you know, talking about Will and Chris didn't deserve this. Well, I think that white folks will always say to black people that violence isn't the answer, because if I allow you to be violent, then you can actually turn that righteous violence against me, right? And so for whatever we believe Will Smith's issues are, I'm telling you, I think that we are not considering the perspective of, you know, a Tiffany Haddish and more importantly, Jada Pinkett Smith, who had to endure that and even the chuckles from the audience, right? Um, so Maya Angelou once had this poem, that I think it was called The Mask, but she was talking about how this woman, uh, a domestic worker, was on the bus and she laughed. Right. And so Maya says in her um, her story of, of this experience, you know, I wondered why she laughed. And then she said, oh, I understand. I understand what that laugh is. Right. That like I'm uncomfortable, but I understand where I'm at. So I need to kind of like play that off. Um, at no point was that discomfort not known from Jada at no point at all. At no point did someone in the audience not recognize, you know, that that joke, not okay at all, even if you are a comedian, right? Um, at no point. And then there is a history there. There is an absolute history of Jada being maligned for her beliefs um, at the Oscars, specifically by Chris Rock. And when I hear people, um, not necessarily anybody in here saying this, but, you know, some of the the political um, placating was, it's just hair. Does it take all of this? Well, there is cultural significance for Black women in hair, 
Like we just had to pass federal legislation for us not to be discriminated against in order to wear our hair out as it naturally grows. So that's where I stand on the issue. Other than that, hey y'all, my name is Dr. Tria Allen and I am a professor at Pima Community College and I'm just happy to be here with my good sister and Dr. Hart, it is really great to see you again. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna, um, I, I want us to focus a little bit on Jada uh, Pinkett Smith and just the, um, and I'm, I'm gonna try and swap my computer really quick uh, as you guys start diving into this answer because it's freezing up pretty badly on my yeah. end. But um, I wanna talk about just the lack of, of voice and, um, and response that's been given to her. I mean, the whole focus of the joke about her and the, the defense of the action as it was well, well defending her um, and the public blame for what happened, even though it was Will's action and Chris's words, um, somehow the entire situation was put on it being her fault. Why do we think that is the response to just her as a woman and as a black woman? Um, and why, why was it so easy to put that blame on her? And you know, Jada is a strong black woman. She's from Baltimore. She doesn't have thick skin. She doesn't. And I think that, in my opinion, I think that her adversarial um, gesture or d discontent to the facial expression she made after it was done, I think it has to go back to the history of the 2016 when Chris had stated something earlier about her. I think this was a buildup for Jada. I don't think that Jada is that uncomfortable with the G.I. Jane joke. I really don't. I think that um, it was like the expression I saw her make was like, oh, God, Chris, here we go again. You're going to, you know, use me symbolically to open up your your um, your dialogue for, for your jokes, because he never even used any of the approved jokes that were on his monologue. Um, it was just like, here we go again. Sometimes you get to the point where you just you, you just get tired of it. And for a black man in particular, um, to be able to say those things to another black woman, I think it was it, it was insensitive of, of Chris Rock. How would he like it if someone put his wife or daughter or mom or anybody that was close to him in that position publicly? You have a hundred million people watching this publicly and internationally and nationally. I thought I saw her disdain in that. I don't think it was so much as the alopecia. She's always worn short hair. She's cut her hair before she even came out to said that she had alopecia. Um, it's just that, you know, black men have not always stood on the platform to support black women. And, and that's sad to say. And if it's been done and hasn't been publicized to the point where I think that we can feel that we can embrace it. And Will is going to protect his wife. He's going, I'm going to come at you. I'm going to come for you. And I agree with the Tiffany Haddish remark in terms of the love and to embrace it. I just, I, my, my platform still remains in terms of it's not the space and place for it. It's really, truly not. I just, I, my, my platform. Are we frozen? Nope, you're back. Okay, yeah. So I just, you know, I don't think totally that it was something that nope, you yeah. should have taken that okay. moment yeah. to so have gone up on the stage you know, to hit I somebody. I don't believe it. It was something that nope, you yeah. should have taken that okay. moment yeah. so to have gone up on the stage you know, to hit I somebody. I don't believe it. it was something that nope, you should have taken that nope, moment yeah. I think it's working now. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. You're on a little bit of an audio delay, Destiny. Can you go ahead and mute for uh, just a moment? And then I'll uh, bring you in here in a second. Okay. 
All right, Dr. Hart, uh, please continue. Um, I like a statement that was made by a Cuban boxer. His name is Jordinus Vegas, um, and he was very concerned about the incident. But I thought it was very um, on time for his remark when he says, I am here to motivate you and to help you build a high and strong self-esteem. And that was the message that he had for Jada Pinkett um, for that reason. And for he didn't support the act that Will did, but he wanted her to feel strong in her stance and her position. And actually, I would like to have heard more from her. She gave a, a, a small statement that says, I'm ready for healing. Are you? But while we sit here and we dialogue and hear all the comments national and locally, it would have been nice to hear how she was really made to feel because we were all second guessing what we thought, what we feel, what we think. And this is not only just about <clears throat> Jada, but it's about any woman who is struggling. This Cuban boxer, um, Yardinus Yagas, he has alopecia because he has no eyebrows. And he said he knows how it feels. He has he was bullied and growing up and he had to go listen to remarks. He became a boxer to defend himself. But he wants to encourage others who are in those same positions to be strong um, in that we can say what we would have done if we were in her place or what we wouldn't have done. I think that in all, in all defense to any woman who's struggling with hair issues, we, we respect that. We should celebrate it. And that um, for Jada not to, to have made her physical, her physical animation that she was upset with it. And this whole conversation, I think it draws more attention to what we're assuming how she feels about it. I don't know if Jada was really upset about the remark or is she upset that this happened again or that she's tired of hearing it again or she's uncomfortable with her alopecia. We don't know those things. That's why I say it would be nice to hear from her. All right, Miss Evans, we are talking about uh, the Oscars slap gate. Uh, we've talked a bit about um, just the initial responses to it, but right now we're just talking about um, what about Jada <laughs> and why she has not been given voice in this conversation. So share with us just your thoughts on, on the situation and uh, where you think her voice fits or, or needs to be more present as part of this conversation? So off the bat, I would first like to point out that no Black people should have been at the Oscars at all, um, given their treatment and misuse of us. I mean, so I, I'm going to put in some history because pop culture is was one of my um, studies in NAU. And so um, Gone with the Wind was the first ever time we, as a Black society, were, um, were given an award for the Oscars. And they gave it to, I forgot her name and I apologize, but I can post it later. Um, they gave it to her for um, Best Supporting Actress. Now, she was not allowed to even be at the Oscars to accept her award to even celebrate that. Um, further down the line, we had Indigenous, um, the uh, Godfather, uh, actor, one of the actors wanted to refuse the um, Oscar nomination due to Hollywood's participation in misusing and their destructive depictions of the indigenous population. John Wayne, or uh, I believe that's his name, he tried to kill the actress, the indigenous actress that went up to explain what was going on. It took six bodyguards to stop him from to, and I quote, because this is what he said on multiple um, accounts, um, to teach her a lesson. So already I'm seeing like a cultural dissidence of how they like to um, like to be and how we're supposed to be. I mean, we weren't even invited to the table. So uh, coming down, there's a lot of individuals that I want to point to, um, a lot of convicted child uh, rapists and uh, um, sex offenders that the Oscars have willingly uh, 
Uh, so I have, sorry, I have a few. Um, and I just want to make sure that everybody is aware that this slap, um, and I and I do understand how others might, uh, violence isn't the answer, but we as a Black community have, Black women have never been protected. We have always been defaced, demarginalized, destroyed. So finally getting to see somebody their actions and their consequences meeting was absolutely awe-inspiring and it was beautiful. It was beautiful to finally see that I, as a woman, as a black woman, am actually protected by <coughs> because I don't see that a lot. And I can go into the statistics about that. I can go into culturally how we have kind of divert. We have this hierarchy of, oh, black love is so beautiful. But that's, it doesn't exist. It's a myth. It's a legend. It's beautiful to think about it, but the black male community does not support the queer or the black woman. I have not seen it. Usually they talk over us or they want to be in front instead of, you know, sitting down and letting us talk. Oh, we used to be in the motherland. Um, so, sorry, these actors' names, I, I'm just absolutely terrible with them. But Woody Allen... Um, he sexually assaulted not only his daughter, his biological daughter, but um, an adopted daughter. He then married her when she was 17 and was awarded three times with uh, Oscar nominations. And the Oscars has never, um, so they, con they condemned Will Smith's actions, but they've never condemned his actions. Woody Allen isn't allowed in the States anymore because he was found guilty of child um, endangerment and abuse. And so the Oscars allowed him in the Philippines to have a little um, party just for him to, uh, to accept his awards. And this is only the first one. So um, I think that just these examples alone should show that there's a hypocritical, um, there's a hypocrisy. There's, yeah, there's a, there's a hypocritic um, viewing in this. So <laughs> we're supposed to um, play by their rules. Uh, but we're not allowed to express herself. And also, I don't believe Jada, I don't believe she should have expressed herself. That is that is a personal matter. If she might not be reactive, she might have been reactive inside. I don't think that she should tell us how she feels. It doesn't matter. She was disrespected. Will came to her aid. Chris, Chris Rock had to make a... Uh, a documentary about black women's hair because his daughter was being teased. So he, there's no excuse to why he was making this joke. You look at his behavior, his whole entire career, as well as many others like Tyler Perry, his whole career is making fun of black women. So I, I don't feel sorry for him. And I feel um, he has said in numerous of his shows that uh, no one is above a butt whooping. That includes him. Um, I I would like to hear Jada Pinkett. Jada Pinkett. I would like to hear what how she felt about what Chris said, so we would all know, not have to assume. I would. I would like to hear authentically how she feels. We don't. We won't know to move forward until we hear from her. Maybe we will never hear, but I don't want to make assumptions and about what the facial expression meant. We don't know what it meant. We don't know if she was, you know, whatever, sarcastic, uh, if she felt that he was being sarcastic. But I think it's, if I'm offended and I, you know, I want people to know why I'm offended so the action doesn't happen again, especially if I can talk and be or speak directly to the offender or offenders. You know, you cannot move forward if people don't know, know you don't know who you offend. That's what they say the problem is with racism. People don't know they've done something inappropriate unless you tell them. People can't assume things. You know what they say about that. So I'm not saying that I will hold my breath waiting for Jada to share her opinion about this. But I could tell you one thing. I bet you dollars to donuts that she did not expect her husband to do that. I really don't think that's what she expected her husband to do. She showed her disdain, her discomfort with it. 
um, and, and her feeling for not liking what was said. We all have those black sister looks when something goes down and we show our expressions because we're not able to talk. And she used the only behavior she was able to use at that point. Will reacted. And that was the wrong thing to do. And Denzel said something interesting on, when I saw him on TD Jakes. He said, the devil got inside him. When you're at your highest point in life, there's someone waiting to knock you off that ledge. Now he can't even enjoy the glory that he's waited for all these years, you know, because he's resigned for the Academy. I mean, that may mean nothing to him or anybody else. Now Netflix and all these other movie execs are pulling out his movies. Who wants to use all this time in their career to start as a DJ in Philadelphia being recognized as one of the top DJs and you make your way in history across the screen for this to happen. And that's going to follow him for a very, very, very long time. Uh, when, when we talk about that, I look at it, Will Smith's career, um, the Muhammad Ali, the um i forgot the one movie that he he did about the nfl and the treatment of athletes with um concussions will smith should have already received the prince of bel-air should have already received oscars multiple um a lot of black media and pc color media should have but that's that's kind of like my mom says we know how the world should work and we know how it actually works. And it works by consciously destroying and um, placing, packaging, repackaging the dead bodies or the, um, the mentally ill bodies of black individuals. So what Will did might've shocked people. It might've been like, oh, good heavens. How could you do that? But I think it was a wake up call. Your laws, your social norms are destructive, disgusting, and they are not working. They are not helping. And this will probably, I think they're trying to stop it from becoming a norm, but it should, because it already is. I mean, in the white culture, they had Pamela Anderson, um, at there at the VMAs, her ex-boyfriend was talking about her, very derogatory. Her husband got up and punched the man in the face. Why are we not talking about that? Why are we not talking about the times that white males would go up to the Oscars or the Emmys or these highly prestigious <laughs> award ceremonies and they're drunk, they're, they're sexual allegations. Why are we not talking about their behavior? And I feel like we know, I feel like as a community, we all know why. As a community, we all know why Will Smith is being a scapegoated because they couldn't get Dave Chappelle. So who do you go to now? You go to Will. Will has done nothing in his career that has been shocking, edgy, provocative. And so they're now just throwing him to the wolves because, oh no, somebody actually met consequences to their actions. Now it could now it would have been different if Chris had gone through the proceeding correctly, did not go off script and did the funny little jokes that the Oscars said yes to. He did not. I feel like the blame goes and I don't want to say blame, but I feel like if your sole purpose in life is to sell and distribute your people's emotions legacy so stereotypical and diseased something is going to happen and it did it was a slap it was it wasn't even a slap it was a little love tap you know i think it's very interesting that i the interview with his mother she was in shock she stated it um, she said she had never seen him like that before, never seen him respond to anything like that. And that was all telling for the comments from his mom, which tells me that there, Willis has, has suppressed a lot. I think it was more than the slap across Chris Rock's face that can be reverberated throughout the Dolby Theater. 
a slap is something that I felt and heard. And that is something that shook him to the point where he almost was knocked over. I mean, he, he put fever and venom in that slap. And it was all, all about something that I think it was a lot more than the alopecia. The more about his wife being offended by it. I think that Will has been suppressing, 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 and that he's been holding in a lot. And without thinking, he acted. Without thinking, he responded. And this is what we saw. So the what, as they say in the, in the neighborhood, is fact. What happened, happened. There is going to be a conversation about it. Why did it happen? Why did it need to happen? And what if Chris Rock did this, that, and the other? The fact is that Chris went off monologue. Fact is, he said what he said. The fact is, Jada responded. And the fact is that Will reacted to it. And the fact is, he reacted with his anger, his venom, his whatever else was going on inside Will. And he felt, um, he felt vindicated when he walked away. You could see it on his face. And he was still angry when he sat down. Now, you know, to sit back in an audience and to sit next to your mom, not that he was sitting next to his mom, but the disrespect to women, you know, black, you know, he didn't think about it any further than that. He let his anger continue to tip over, you know, he, he let it spill over. These are things that um, shouldn't have happened. And I think he was totally out of control at that point. I really think that he snapped. And we can't justify what happens when somebody gets to that point. There's a thin line between sanity and insanity. We all have that propensity to be able to, to react. But we have to, um, you know, be careful, especially when the night is yours. The night was Will's. The night was his to bask in everything that he's done. And he's done some remarkable things. And I really think his best works were Muhammad Ali I think that was his best work, Muhammad Ali and King Richard. I think those two, because they never talked about Muhammad Ali. And I agree with you, Destiny. He should have gotten his his roses before King Richard. He's done some phenomenal things. Now, if you remember when he did his first piece, Six Degrees of Separation, Will has a tendency he gets into he gets into the the um, the character and he gets into it. He got into that character of six degree of separation. It took him a long time to get out of it because the girl he was dating at the time said, "Wait a minute, now this you wait. When are you going to transpose yourself back?" And I really think that he got into the character of King Richard, where he said to this, he said King Richard had to defend himself all the time. King Richard did that. Serena's father when he reacted to something that happened to he and his children. Will did not have to respond to that. So I want to put this out here really quickly. Let's say Will stayed at his seat. He knew his wife was upset. Why couldn't Jada, as the wife said, baby, no, it's okay. Tap him on the hand or the shoulder. Or he could have leaned over closer. What black men often would do to make me feel comfortable, hug me, make me feel secure. Baby, I got you. I'm not going to pull out my whatever and do what I need to do right now, but make me feel comfortable. There's other ways to do that. And those two things could have happened. Why did he not choose that? Um, he snapped. He got out of, he got out, he got into character of what he wanted to do to send a message to the world. And ultimately it hurt him. And now it hurts Jada even more. And it's hurting the children as well. And all his surrounding all his friends, many of them, are, don't even want to be associated with Will anymore because of that. I don't want to see someone work hard at their craft. I mean, all of us on this panel t this evening and those that are listening, do you want to have one thing that you do to change your reputation for five minutes of doing something um, that you haven't given much thought for? Now, we've been in positions with Karens of the world, Kins of the world, black men who've done this, that, and the other. How often do we have to show discipline with ourselves as black women? Because we know we had crossed that line in the workplace, in the supermarket, on the bus, in the street. We have these things that happen to us often. 
But why do we always have, and I guess that this might be it, like my, and I, I'm not trying to be rude. I respect my, I respect you, my elders. I respect you guys inviting me into the, onto the kitchen table. I finally get to. Um, why do we have to be perfect? Why am I constantly having to up? Why do I have to be Atlas? Why do I have to hold not only every single black person before me, every single black person now and later on to come on my shoulders when I walk out of my house? Why is it every time as the black woman, oh, you have to have your chin up. You have to have this done. You have to have this, this and that. Why does Jada have to do any of this? Why did she, why? Why, did, why couldn't she just be her? It's kind of like the same, we're doing the, it's the same issue with, with the judge. The judge was crying after hours and hours of being berated by stupidity, ignorance, just spewing out. And she cried and they're like, oh, well, she's emotional. What do you want me to be? Either you want me to be emotional or you don't want me to be emotional. If you don't want me there, why does, why does Jada have to be perfect? Why is what Will do so, did so shocking? I mean, Kyle Burnick, I think I said his name wrong, with the NFL. He was sitting down and then finally a Marine was like, hey, don't sit down, kneel. It's more respectful. Still people look at Kaepernick and want to kill him, even though a Marine was like, hey, I, it's more respectful for you to kneel down to me in solidarity for what I've done and for what your people have gone through. Why, why do we constantly have to change our expressions to fit and, and, and help ease the, the white mindset why 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 do I, why do i have constant why can't i be me what what if i'm loud and i'm angry and i'm upset why can't i do that why do i have to go when i get home i i get to be upset when when we are outside of the eye of the white man then we'll talk about it why and and then and then not like oh well he might not have known he might not have done this it is 2022 the internet is free you should already know that black women struggle with this, with their identities being stripped and repackaged to everybody. Why do I constantly have to be perfect just to just to even exist? I mean, I'm still being made fun of. I'm I'm still being ostracized. Why do I have to be perfect? Why can't I be like you know? Or why why can't my other half be like enough? Absolutely I not. I, I mean, let me tell you, I actually agree with you, Destiny. I 100% agree with you. And for a couple of reasons. But I want to point something out here really quickly. We have shifted this conversation back to men's actions. I want to shift it back to Black feminist theory or fe Black feminist thought, right? So we package this Black feminist thought as a theory for other people to understand how Black women experience the world. But for Black women, this is just the way we experience the world. As someone with an autoimmune disorder, I can tell you that sometimes they come with depression. Sometimes the, the public face that we have to put on in order to just be seen in public, because y'all, it's not just simply about Jada wearing short hair at all. And if we did some of the research when she like openly discusses this on Red Table Talk about her struggles with losing her hair and then the just the, you know, this um, decision to just go forward and sh cut it off so that she could maintain some semblance of control. This is not simply just about hair. It is so much more than just hair. The cultural com component that we're not discussing, right, that many people don't understand is this idea of run up, get done up, right? So Chris, you went off script, you're talking this all this yang, um, Will has a reaction at the bottom line Jada does not have to explain her emotions to anybody. It was clear on her face when she said she was dis like when she visibly showed that she was dis she was not comfortable with it, or it was just a nuisance for her to handle. I got to tell you, her husband stepping in so that Jada doesn't have to do the press junket of Jada, what were you feeling? And that she can just continue to create content around her looks. That was probably the most refreshing thing I've ever seen, honestly. Because usually, in, whether it be professional or entertainment, one thing that I have experienced is that Black women have to hold it down. And I do not expect other people to run in. It has always been Black women who have been my saving grace. And I've had brothers afterwards say, oh, man, what you said in there was really good. Keep up the good work. 
this idea that we have to wait and separate our full beans until we get into, get home to discuss it, absolutely not. Because then it, it still situates us and centers us in this center of a white gaze that we don't want to act a certain way in public. We don't want to do things that are deemed inappropriate. We are having right now with Slapgate the same conversation that Stokely Carmichael and um, MLK were having about respectability politics. I'm not going to tell you that violence isn't the answer because if that's not the case, we should have never been in Iraq. We should have never been in the Middle East. But what is really interesting here is that when the victim, when the stated victim, the intended victim is a black woman, we turn this into, well, is violence ever the answer? Clearly, clearly. Otherwise, why are we giving awards for it? And if we're talking about violence against black women, we have to also include the social violence that occurs or the work that we have to do to manage our facial expressions um, in the, you know, as um, Destiny, you brought up, like in, you know, the case of the Honorable Katanji Brown J Jackson, the manner in which she had to like just manage her facial expressions so that she wouldn't be called angry, so that she wouldn't be called um, mammy or these other things. So even the conversation that we're having is still steeped in the white gaze. And that's kind of where I want to just kind of disrupt it a little bit. Oh, Kara. Let's, let's go there. Let's talk about um, that whole process and the, the confirmation hearings for Judge Jackson. And um, what I, we were talking about this at the, uh, before the program started and a little bit at the beginning and in the introduction to it, of just seeing the vitriolic questions with which she was met as its own form of violence um, that was seen as acceptable and allowed to go on for days while she was expected to sit there and be presentable in her response and reaction to it and not respond in an emotional way and not push back um, in a way that would have been seen as disrespectful to people who were clearly disrespecting her. So let's talk about why that was deemed acceptable and let's just move into that conversation about her confirmation hearings. So Dr. Tria, do you want to start us off there? And then uh, we'll, we'll move around the kitchen table and hear other, other people's thoughts on this. I, you know, there is so much going on in this confirmation hearing. And I don't know if y'all watched it or even just watched the replay, but there's a moment in here um, where before she responds, she sighed. <laughs> And I don't know if y'all ever had that feeling where you were like, man, I know this sigh. I know this sigh. This, this like the mental gymnastics of having to like deal with um, questions that are out of the purview of her practice, her scope of practice, and even like her, her expertise area. So there was this conversation about, do you believe babies are racist? And she was like, oh, goodness. Um, and then there was the, the other question about, well, how would you define a woman? And then even her answers were like just really unacceptable um, at all. Or do you go to church? So we see the this same kind of like there is a historical precedence for this. And I think it was like Nanny Wright. Um, oh, it's not Wade. Nanny Wright something. But the idea was Black women had to present themselves as more clean, as more holy, as more pious um, to subvert the atrocities that were happening to them as domestics. So they would go in, clean a house and probably walk out a, a victim of sexual violence. So if they were clean, if they could speak well, if they had diction and they were trained to do this in order, um, I think the, the article is bed, broom and bath in order for them to like manage that and then how long and how we socialize our daughters to do the same because we don't want we don't want you to be misconstrued the right way well here's the thing um honorable judge jackson is very qualified matter of fact she is overqualified and highly qualified and more qualified than those who are actually sitting on the bench both men and women 
right? She has comported herself over over the years of her of her uh, her career w- with the highest the highest order of ethics. Something that we are not even seeing on the current Supreme Court right now. <coughs> Clarence Thomas, right, <coughs> and his wife, right. So I I find it really interesting that this woman has had to sit through the ridiculousness of senators who do not have anything else to critique her on. Y'all, we have a whole judge, um, and she is a woman, sitting on the bench right now who has never tried a case, who who didn't know um, the edicts of a law or, or the statutes that would govern making a decision. And we've excused that. We we also have a judge who was accused of sexual violence sitting on the highest court right now. And there is no ethical, um, you know, there's no ethical binder that, that, you know, really creates or charges them all to comport themselves in a, in a very specific way. We have another judge who has a wife who had questionable practices and he himself who um, was probably perpetuating, or not probably, um, who was found not guilty of perpetuating, um, you know, um, sexual harassment. But we even grilled the Black woman who sat in the same seat who levied the complaint against that judge as well. But it's okay for us to harass and malign the character of a very qualified and overqualified and a highly qualified judge um, candidate for the SCOTUS, for the, you know, um, the highest court in the land. History, white gays, white supremacy. So when we're talking about this and um, Dr. Hart or Ms. Evans, either of you can can take this question, what really strikes me or what has stricken me in the confirmation hearings and in the the discussions following have been those who sat on that panel or were observant who will be voting on whether or not she should be confirmed, who have made the statement that she is well qualified, she's more than qualified, she she, uh, has all of the qualifications that we would be looking for, but I'm voting no anyway for one reason or another. What is your response to that and why is it considered acceptable in uh, in confirming this highly qualified judge? It was just like um, when Obama won the election the first time, the Republicans got together and went across the street to the Trump Hotel and made a decision collectively to veto everything that came across their desk and to make sure that he was going to be a one-time president. That didn't happen, of course. This is just a repeat of the same thing with the voter suppression, with regentrification, with redlining, with all of that. These Republicans have gotten together. I don't, you know, listen, the questions and the interview, it wasn't an interview, it was interrogation, was so ridiculous and silly. It was just a waste of television time and a waste of her time. And I'm really, um, they're, they're supporting the Republic. They might as well have all come out with hoods on, with the eyes and the nose cut out, because they all look like the Klan sitting up there in suits and ties. It was, I, I don't even, I don't even want to give it oxygen to repeat anything that Holly and Lindsey Graham and, and um, Ted Cruz and the rest of them stated. Um, but I, you know, one of my, I think one of my my aha moments was when Ted Cruz showed her the book "Baby Anti Baby Racist" or something. Sister Girl did not hold it in that time because she finally she she took her breath and she looked at Ted Cruz like really. So there were times where she wasn't trying to have that strong demeanor and just to, to have that professional aura all the time because we don't need to always do that. We don't have to show, put on a show just to please the white constituents because they don't frankly give a damn. They really don't. Every response that she gave was highly articulate. It was highly, they, she taught them a lesson. You had lawyers quizzing her and didn't even know what she, what, what, what the, what the response should have been. So, um, one of the points I want to make is, it's ultimately ridiculous when I see Brent Kavanaugh at his congressional hearing, as I remember it, 
when he sat up there, had this woman to fly in from California. You think this woman was making this stuff up? And he stood up there and basically laid everybody out and said he didn't like what he was that he was being put through. Um, and talked about how he drink beer. Doesn't everybody drink beer? And so what if you don't? I mean, he was violent, in my opinion. He was rude. He was loud. If Kataji Jackson Brown did anything that Brent did, she would have been they would have stopped the congressional interviews right then and there. That would have been the end of it. Number two, um, Barrett Coney, whatever her name is. She slid on ice to get through. This woman has little experience. I mean, she it, it was just a joke to get her in there. She had no experience, couldn't communicate, couldn't provide any feedback. They asked her soft questions. She gave soft responses, and she was the epitome of the white girl. And I, it just disgusted me that she paraded all these refugee children and black and so forth in front of the, the whole world to see. So we know what Katanji Jackson Brown is going through. And we know that how ridiculous it was and how hurtful it was to sit there and see that black woman go through that. And I thought I was one day, I want to share this with you when I was watching, I think it was the first day and it was the 11th hour when Cory Booker finally came in and he started to give her a chance to breathe because this woman had been pent up for 11 hours dealing with these silly, ridiculous, stupid questions. And he finally let her breathe. And, he's, and when he started to talk, I put myself, I'm a Kataji Jackson Brown. I'm sure you have been in those same experiences. And I don't know if I could have done what she did. Because I would have gotten up and thrown down, thrown my, I'm out. Do what you want to do. And I would have laid them out like Brent Kavanaugh did, but got away with it because he's a white man. Okay. It was ridiculous. And if this woman gets it, will get her confirmation without the Republicans, hopefully, because they're deadlocked right now, but she doesn't need the Republican Senate to get through. But to know what she went through for three days, to know that everything that she's worked for all her years, and Lindsey Graham was one of the people that supported her on the federal court appointment. And now he acts like he doesn't remember anything. I just don't understand how they could just parade stupidity in front of the world and expect for everybody to just to sit back and applaud it. I just hope that she's strong enough to say, I do want to continue to go through this because that's very stressful. It's very hurtful and harmful. I feel very bad that her daughters were sitting there and had to look at that, her mom and her dad and her husband and her brothers and other extended family members were there for her to get grilled like that. I mean, it reminded me of her being, it reminded me of slavery, 100%, when you're strapped down naked and you're whipped by the slave master. That's what I saw. It was a brutal whipping. And I think it was disgusting. And Republicans should not call themselves senators. Now, Ted Cruz quit the school at Harvard. And so did Kataji Brown. Okay. She made her a review. He didn't. So he came at her from a different angle. It was all hateful. It was all jealousy. It was to ridicule her, ridicule her and make her feel at the lowest that she could feel. They all had their personal agendas. And we know that Ted Cruz and the rest of them are trying to get their cameo moments for the presidency because he's running for president, right? And they all want to have their little captions that they're using Kataji Brown as their opportunity to stand on that platform. So I think it was ridiculous. It was sad for her to have to endure that. Um, and I hope that every young black child in high school and college or law school or in the community knows how to stand strong and be, and don't, you know, don't, don't buckle to it. But there is a time where you have to just say, wait, enough is enough. And I think she did that in some instances with, her 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 um animations. Miss Evans, your first thoughts on all of this. I I want to thank her her white husband. And I don't and I don't want it to be rude because people might be like, oh favoritism. I'm not. Hit the way he loved her just so openly and enthusiastically. Yeah, he did. Like he just he is one of the reasons, and I don't like to assume, I really don't want to say that was the reason why she kept going, because many multiplying reasons why she kept going. But just to know that passion, that fire, that somebody is is 
just that that love was just so natural, so beautiful. It was it was a it's just like the slap, but but the just love. It's it's an odd way to explain it, and I know, but just seeing how much she was wanted, loved, and supported by him so unapologetically. And I feel like a lot of us can look at that, especially as black women, and I know more so um, to darker black women, um, to actually be loved openly, to, to not have somebody like, oh, I'm dating a black girl, I'm dating one, secretly. It, was, it wasn't a secret. He, was, he, was, he wasn't showing off like, ooh, look, I have a black girlfriend. It was, this is my wife. This is this is the love of my life and the other half of my entity. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely beautiful to see that. And I'm not trying to throw shade, but I, I've noticed that I've never seen such love. And um, well, you you see it, but it's um, it's restrained. It's it's it, it looks like it's been practiced for the broader community, and even with the queer community, you see it. And it was just beautiful to see that. Now we all know that she was going to be dragged through the mud. We all knew and expected that that was going to happen. But actually seeing this man supporting her was was absolutely beautiful. And getting to see her daughters watching her and smiling and that that beautiful picture, I don't know if you guys know that picture of the daughter smiling was absolutely awe-inspiring. It was to see this love un coached and i and i look at the democrat at the democratic party and i apologize um i'm independent but i look at both parties and i'm like democrats you didn't do anything you didn't you you did nothing that wasn't already practiced there there was no yes there was crying and a little like oh like you're my mom and i feel for you if you feel like that's your mom then step up stop them from doing this or put your foot down be like hey this is inappropriate this is not the good now her lawyer did that the individual by her did that several times but there's only so many times he can do that so to see these individuals st standing here and being like i'm cheering for you but way back here <laughs> that that wasn't that wasn't at all helpful for me like yes it's amazing what she's doing and what she represents that's beautiful to pinpoint that but we already know that that's why we're here so to you to spit, state the obvious it's kind of like okay we'll sit down you got your little hashtag that's cute and everything what i want is you to i want i don't want an ally i want and, and miss bernadine says it well i want um I want an accomplice. I want somebody standing with me who's going to get in trouble. So you know that I can't look at Ted Cruz and be like, you're an idiot. You are an imbecile. I can't say that. But you could. You could be like, hello, Ted. Tre uh, Ted. That's inappropriate. Why are you asking her these questions? What does her being a Christian have anything to do? We do not live in a solely Christianic nation. That's That's one of the founding rules that we are not supposed to. So why is this being questioned? As a judge, allowing them to ask, why didn't you step up? Push that person. Be like, no, no, no. <clears throat> why why wasn't she given easy, cute questions like the other girl was? Why like, well, when you get up here, what do you think women might see or what do you think women might uh look towards to you? What kind of question is that? What what, what question is that? Why didn't she get those? Why couldn't it be two really racially stupid questions and then one fun one? Could the Democrats not work that out? Like I, I'm just I'm just trying to figure out. It's no one is innocent in this in this ruling to me. No one is. Because you can you can give me confetti, but I'm still shot at the end. I'm still leaking and bleeding. So she was still paraded around, dragged through the mud. But you got your your two seconds, your two minutes of yay, we got this, we're doing our jobs. And I and I feel like it's what she went through was horrifying. And it was just like a slave auction, just like a whipping. 
but I felt that she wasn't she wasn't supported at all by by the outer communities. Like yes, we were you know cheering for her and hoping for her, but seeing that man sh unshameful loving on her was was one of the highlights that I have seen in my life. It was absolutely beautiful to see. It's like, oh, we can be loved. Black women can be loved. And like you, you do see it. Like I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to say like, oh, yeah, you do see it. There are when you do see it, but it's 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 coached. It it feels awkward to see it, and seeing that was, I liked it. Well, can can I just push back really quickly? I just need clarification. Black women are loved, y'all. Like, even though it's not in the media, we are loved. No, I, I, I get me. I fiercely love. Just statistically sister. speaking, now I, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out, you know, my 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 cute little degree. Statistically speaking, black women are not desirable at all. We are not desirable. Seventy six percent of us will die single. Oh, and that that is that wait, is wait wait we can't. Okay, so this this is what I want to say. Um because i don't want us to like just throw stuff out there because i'm part of the 76 percent who'll probably never be married again but that's a choice you know no i'm not saying i'm not saying yeah. i'm not trying to throw out the choice but i'm saying so you have let's say you have 10 people that are like i choose to be single awesome and then you have you actually ask those 10 people and you find out the three of them are like no i would actually like to be loved but i'm in any any dating like eHarmony has shown people don't like black people. Um, uh, Bumble has shown people will literally be, no black people. They will they will just swipe away from. Uh, and usually a black person on Bumble and eHarmony only lasts two weeks before they before the algorithm removes them or ghosts them. So, so that shows you, like, even though it's like, I want to be loved and I'm loved, that's great and wonderful and fine. But how are you supposed to find somebody if. Okay, if so I want to, this is where I want to caution us, right? Because we're using centers, we're using systems that are white centric. And by white centric, I mean like a power structure. Perhaps this isn't the way that we go about finding mates. Some of us use these systems and that's fine. But. Um, I think when we bring it back to an analysis of Black women being unprotected in a society, yes, we can prove that. But I also want us to be cautious of how we are viewing that. Because even the ways that we make um, we, we make meaning around being loved, I mean, this was Alice Walker's whole work with womanism. Her entire work with womanism. This was Zora Neale Hurston's like call to, like her love letter to the fiercely independent Black woman um, and and her her ability to say I will not write from a white gaze like even before before Toni Morrison said it you know this is her ability to be the anthropologist and to dig into the backgrounds of black women um, Janie her grandmother her her mother who experienced Janie's mother who experienced sexual violence and her her determination to still hold strong when Langston Hughes and um, Richard Wright said to Zora Neale Hurston, how dare you write about black people in this way, right? And so I wanna just make sure that when we are giving this analysis on black women and, and yes, we do experience trauma out in these racialized streets, we also have places of joy and places of softness um, as well. I don't think that this is what you're not saying, Destiny, um, by the way, but I just wanna make sure because somebody's gonna listen to this talk and be like, see, Destiny said black women aren't blah, 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 blah. No, like statistically, if we are looking at the systems, um, systems based on algorithms that are based on white culture, 100% absolutely. You know, I'm gonna hold you down, little sis. And it's not but, even white culture. It's, it's. I, I wanna say it's PC, PC culture. Black women right, are not is, loved. We are not loved. I mean, I don't wanna be rude and be like, look at rap music. Look at all of the music ever. We're not loved. Even <laughs> even when there's a love song about us, like I, the old, old, there's a country song about like wait her her back is like a country road. It's still like your music video is of a white girl, but the song is about a black girl. Why'd you do it? Oh, because country still hasn't come to the conclusion that they were made by black people and they're uncomfortable with black people to begin with. So it's just when you look at what I'm I guess what I'm trying to say is 
we are always little puppets with strings. And we have to act a certain way. Like the Obamas had to act a certain way. Like Obama could hold Michelle's hand and be like, oh, we're so cute. But he couldn't be like, he couldn't, he couldn't act like what I saw. Now, of course, they, they did that, you know, of, of course, behind. But in the white gaze, we have to be this little Barbie and Ken. We have to do certain movements the way in which they're expected of us. We can't go off script. I don't know, Miss Carol, what you think? <laughs> I enjoy being the facilitator because I <laughs> just listen to what Can I all say something? Say. Um, I'll come back, but yes, Dr. Allen, or Dr. Hart, excuse me, go ahead. So I will say that back to Katanji specifically in the congressional inter interrogation, um, the, 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 the trolls, the one, the five congressmen that came after her so hard, including the one woman, um, black women are a threat. We have been deemed the, um, we are now the public enemy number one. It used to be the black man. It's the black woman. They are afraid that this woman is going to get on this Supreme court where she will. And she's, um, embodied with so much knowledge and information um, that this is going to throw their secret plans to the left. Okay. This woman is powerful and smart and she is a threat. Black women are a threat. When you come equipped with knowledge, information, expertise, credentials, degrees, etc., We are a threat. I don't know how what you have experienced in the workplace, but it has been almost laughable. The more credentials you walk in the door with, and don't be able to speak the king's or queen's English and be able to know right from wrong and don't bow down and those things. Um, it lessens your opportunity for more progressive evolution to professional growth. And this is what the fear is behind Katanji. Now, I don't, you know, when she, now this is interesting. When all the selections were out there, these different women from North Carolina, South Carolina, California, and two were from the East Coast. Um, when Katanji was selected, the, the conversation was, well, she has a white husband. You know, she's not going to be as effective. That was something that became, a, a, you know, a concern for many that spoke to that. But this woman has proven otherwise. She knows who she is. Her husband knows who she is. He supports her. They met in grad school. And I think it's a very good union. And I look forward to her being a formidable part of the, uh, the Supreme Court. And I, I just hope that we learn lessons of how to project ourselves. And I agree, we should not always have to hold back our feelings and our temperament. But I don't think we have to get gut bucket, um, you know, ignorant to be able to let these fools know who we really are. Can I can I throw can I complicate this analysis a little bit more? <clears throat> because what we have seen with the Republicans and like every single one, she's highly qualified, she is right. top of the field, she's blah 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 blah. I vote no confidence. Okay, so here's my question: What happens if Kamala Harris, uh, Kamala Harris comes back and she doesn't confirm her? Are we ready for that conversation? Because we keep saying, oh, don't worry, she's going to get on because we have this ace in the hole. But I guess what I want to say is, I'm not saying Kamala is going to do this, um, but have we considered that everybody serving in Congress or everybody serving in our government, even though they look like us, may not have our best interest at heart? What happens if she doesn't um, confirm her? What happens if she doesn't vote um, the way that we believe that she will, then what does that say? So I want to I want to submit to us that it is possible to be a person of color and still be enmeshed and embedded in white supremacy. I am definitely not saying that Vice President Kamala Harris is this person, but I do want to complicate that analysis a little bit more because we have representation on the Supreme Court. But in the instance of one of these judges, um, Clarence Thomas, Clarence, um, 
<laughs> why the collective sigh, y'all? I don't know if y'all noticed, but everybody's body went back and you're like, oh. Uh, you know, <laughs> I can't. I can't breathe. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm pointing out this analysis because uh, we see evidence of we have representation, but oh boy, don't represent me at all. But I we think have, we've always had to do that, though, haven't we? Haven't we always had to? I mean, I guess when I see. Oh, I'm sorry. I pop. No, go, go, go. For, I'm, well, sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, so I, this is the one thing I want to elevate that Dr. Hart, Hart just said, and I don't want us to miss this. Black women have always had to outperform mm -hmm. and our outperformance me, has come at the cost of mm -hmm. we come in as pet and then quickly assessed as threat, especially when our expertise, our work ethic, our ability to get the job done our ability, well, I'm going to educate, well, like Dr. Hart, no, Dr. Hart, you're retired, right? Pardon me? You're retired. I don't want to be like, Dr. Hart. Yes, I am okay. retired. <laughs> um, so Dr. Hart is in, in these consultation streets, but we know really, really quickly that it's, the more degrees that you have, because it has been a function of your survival, the more times you have had to over prepare yourself in order to like be in these spaces, the more those same qualifications make you a threat to the mediocrity that has been allowed to stand. So I want to be very clear in, in saying this is that, yes, we, we can make all of these arguments and we know she's well qualified. But what happens when you sell out because of your investment in white supremacy? Um, and we're talking power structures here. So if these are one of our um, non-melanated brothers and sisters, this is we're not talking about white people. We are talking about power structures because you can be invested in white supremacy and be a person of color because it benefits you. Yeah. And if you do not understand right. white supremacy, everything right. else that we're calling bigoted, sexist, racist, right. um, ageist, you will misunderstand everything that's going on. So my question is, is let's complicate the analysis. We knew that these, um, the, the good old boy club stands, whether people want to acknowledge that or not. But what happens when another woman is sitting across from you and we share genitalia, we share like there are cisgenderedness or whatever um, analysis or whatever our definition of a, of a woman is. What happens when the same person that we are, that are sitting across from us then votes an absolute no after putting it on record that you are highly qualified, that you um, you have worked hard to be here, that you believe that she'll steward in good faith, and then you still say no. You know, along with that, Dr. Allen, I feel like a lot of assumptions have been made in terms of the confirmation hearings of, there's the conversation about the, the Republicans who are voting no, who have said that they are voting no. And it seems that the assumption so far has been that all the Democrats are voting yes. Right. But what happens if, if some of them? So that's part of part of the next question that I wanted to bring to the table is what does it signify or what does it say if um, first of all, what does it say if she is not confirmed? But also, what does it say that we as a, a panel of four black women who look at a figure like Judge Jackson with this level of hopefulness are also looking at it with this level of skepticism, that we are coming to the conversation with that acknowledgement that it might not happen because historically it does not happen. What does that tell us about the systems that we're working in and against for moments like this? Well, I'll say briefly, the systems would be, have been marginalized, they'll be compromised, um, and there's not and, un, and not trusted. It's like an insecure system because you're supposed to know where your fellow political parties stand. That's what politics is about. You're not supposed to assume. You know, if they have been doing their jobs, they have their platform, they have their position. You know, clearly Cory Booker has let everybody know where he stands, and even on the Republican side, Susan Collins has said, "I have you have a yes for me." And so, you know, it will be with everything else that's turning upside down in terms of our rights as a citizen to be in this United States of America. It isn't united. It isn't united. It's divided. 
and it's going to tear us down. It's going to tear us more apart and it's going to diminish hope. And I hope it doesn't happen because, you know, in my quarter of life that I'm in, I want to make sure I would like to give leave hope for the young people behind me. You know, the, 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 it, it, it would just destroy the opportunity to feel prideful, to feel hopeful, and most importantly, to know that hard work pays off. This is what it's all about at the end of the day. Hard work pays off. I mean, this woman went through all the steps to get to where she got to. And for someone in our party or someone who looks like us to say, no, I'm, I don't have any confidence. In fact, as after the congressional hearings, there was a session with some um, legal community, not community, but business leaders. And they had to, they rendered their opinion on her. And, and I don't remember, I don't even want to call her a sister, but the black woman, there was one, she was a counsel and she said, I don't, I don't, I don't want her. I'm not, I don't approve of her. I mean, she outwardly, a black woman expressed her opinion that she wasn't impressed with Katanji. So you never know what goes on in the minds of fools. I think it's odd that, I mean, no, it's not odd. Um, so we look at them individually, like the white world individually, like if something bad happens, it's on the individual. So you have um, with school shootings or with racially stigmatic shootings, it's always like, he's a lone wolf. He, he's having a bad day. Oh, woe weighs him. Um, and then when it's a good thing, like they win a medal, it's like, yay, go us, go community. With it, When it comes to us, we're just automatically assumed as a community. That's never been us, though. We've all had individual um, strives. Like my life as a, as a Black woman is completely different from another. And um, although that is something that I, I would hope that we could maybe stand on and then ground and create a community, that's not necessarily going to happen. So if uh, Kamala does not vote for her, that's not, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be like, oh, the black community isn't together. No, I would want to know what the individual, why I'd want to know why. And then, and then, yes, of course, I'm going to be for a moment, maybe disappointed, but th this is the society we lived in. This, or, or this is the society we have been captive in. It's not shocking at all. It would not be shocking to me. It would be sad, but um, I, I don't want to say- be, It would be America. traumatizing. Yeah, it would be traumatizing. But once again, I mean, we all watched what happened to, to Mr. Floyd. We all know of other people that that's happened to. We know of what they did to- um, I'm sorry to Michael to, Brown, to Michael Trayvon Brown, Martin, Trayvon Martin, Lindo Castell, we Breonna Taylor, to um, Pistol Garrett. Like we know what they're capable of when they're angry. We know what they're capable of when they're not angry. So see, it wouldn't be a betray a trail to me. It'd be like, okay, this individual has their reasons. Am I more likely to not, I'm not going to blame the society that they're, they're enslaved or indoctrinated to. I'm going to be like, okay, so unfortunately the indoctrination did work and you believe that the, that is your free choice. That is unfortunately sad. We as a community have to move forward and work together. But once again, the community can only do so much. There's still the end of it. I mean, nature versus nurture. It's still, you still have nature and you still have nurture. You still have the individual still collectively created. And what they decide to do is what they decide to do. I, I've never thought that that wasn't uh, off the table or off, like ever off the table. There's always, and I feel like as, as a black, as, as a black woman, I feel like we all know this and we wouldn't say it out loud, but you're all, there's always somebody going to shoot you from the back. There is always a shot from the back. Like there's always going to be multiple shots from the front and the side. So you just I'm, have to protect yourself like always and move forward. Like, yes, it will be, it'll be shocking and it'll be a very painful loss for this um, democracy. 
but it's not anything different. It won't be justice. But I don't think that America knows what justice is. And that's that's a just that's a whole different discussion. Exactly. I, I you know, I think there's a couple of things. Um we are rooting hard for um Judge Brown. We are absolutely rooting hard for her. But I also think that we cannot, we don't have the privilege of toxic positive hope our hope has to be critical right and so everything that we're like even with my best hopes if she does not make it i still have to show up and educate my kids i still have to be able to use this as an example when i'm teaching or when when we are facing another day otherwise what we'll see happen is um if we show up with this toxic positivity or this toxic positive hope of this just wishing wishing that um, the best will happen, even though we are well aware of the historical implications of what happens when Black women do amazing things, then I think we're setting ourselves up for failure. And so, Kara, to your question about what does it mean to have like three, like four intelligent women who come to this with high hopes, but also are very critical of the what if, I think this is a this is a demonstration of critical hope that we understand societal systems are in play and we have been both, we have both benefited from those systems, but we have um, more likely some of us uh, have, have experienced, you know, the non-benefits um, of that system um, as well. And so to be, to like throw that to a side, to throw caution to the wind and just be like, oh, it doesn't matter. She's gonna get through. I don't think that's responsible um, at right. all. That makes sense. Yeah. But I, I just think it, it's it's just it, it's generation. It's it's part of that generational trauma. Like you know, not to always you know where to put your hope and where not to. You understand how much hope you're allowed to have for a situation. Like every time I I see you know uh, um, one of us being destroyed or humiliated. You always have that hope like, oh, maybe just maybe once someone will stop. Someone will like if, if a police, I don't know if you guys have seen that video where the police officer is choking the junior police officer for stopping the man from beating the already detained black. Um, I believe his name, um, Starlet Jones or something like that. Um, he physically picked her up and was choking her. And then others tried to stop him, but then they all kind of. They, they stopped themselves from stopping him. And finally, she was able to get him to calm down to let her go. That was one of his own. Shoot. So you, you kind of look at it like, I can't put that faith in it. Hold on, I forgot to plug in my battery. One thing that I love, Dr. Allen, that you always bring to these conversations are some of those those terminologies that I would not have had without your presence in the conversation. That idea of critical hope and avoidance of that toxic positive hope. What I find so interesting is I, I recently just took a one of those quizzes on your levels of optimism and pessimism. And the questions were things like, uh, do you assume that things will go, will typically go well for you? And that sort of, of a question. And by the end of the quiz, it had determined that I am a moderate pessimist. And it was, I don't think I am. <laughs> I think I'm a realist. And I think I am a cautiously optimistic person. But that is not something that I think overall society recognizes as the necessitated place of Black women's hope is it has to have that level of caution behind it because of that historical knowledge and those historical traumas and coming to a moment like this where I would like nothing more than to just be hopeful and believe that this confirmation is going to happen but history has shown me too much 
to go into that sort of hope blindly and to just say, no matter what, yeah, of course she's going to be confirmed. I'm fully bought into this idea. No, it's not that I don't have hope that it will happen. It's that my hope is automatically tapered by experience. Mm -hmm. And I maintain that level of hopefulness, but I also know I need to protect my level of disappointment. If it doesn't happen, there's that, that, thing that's included in Black woman's hope, and I don't have a name for it, but it's that thing that says, be hopeful, but be prepared for if your hopes don't come through. It's kind of like your your mom, uh, the, 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 like the mom voice, where like, you know, you get that talk before school and it's like, don't, you know, you're, you're you have to overachieve, you know this, uh, but don't be hopeful for somebody recognizing that. Don't be encouraged, be but not discouraged. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's the, the encourage, like mom would always, it's like, you know, you get to do this, you get to do that, but don't be discouraged that you aren't picked for this. Like, yes, we know that you have these qualifications. You have the knowledge, you have all this. I see you, I support you. Unfortunately, that's not the community that they, they won't, they can't. They, they, it's not can't a part I Oh, I'm sorry, Destiny. I've talked to um, I want to add another name to this conversation because we have seen similar practices happen with another Black woman who was going up for, she was in her confirmation hearings for, I want to tell you it was the U.S. Attorney General and it was Lainey Grenier who oh, just yeah. recently passed. And so Dr. Hyde, I don't know if you remember this, but Lainey was um getting ready to go up and because she was comp she she was a teacher by mm -hmm. nature and because she was complicating um the analysis of racialized oppression and law and what that meant it was actually democrats who went to bill clinton and said hey man right. this is a bad decision right. it makes us look bad mm -hmm. and so what ends up happening is Bill Clinton had been like, oh, she's amazing. She comes from this, um, I can't remember her mom's name. I think it was like Jerry, but that doesn't feel right either. But she comes from this amazing activist family who has a, you know, who knows the law. Her father went to Harvard, um, but didn't finish. Like absolute brilliant um, black woman, um, Jewish, Jewish, black, right. Jewish um, black woman. He had pumped her up, and because her politic or her um, her pedagogy did not align with the Democratic Party um, or a conservative court, he actually ended up withdrawing the nomination and misaligning her mm -hmm. character, right? And so I think it's really important for us to understand that we see Judge Katanji Jackson. Wait, I always want to say I say her name wrong. Kataji Brown Jackson, we see her up here and we have this hope, but we are not, history is not that long. It's not that long at all. It is ever present. And so on the passing of Lady Grenier, right. what I what I recognize is, is this. She was absolutely qualified. Mm -hmm. She was absolutely um brilliant at what she did. She is probably one of the the she is one of the critical legal studies scholars yeah. and critical race theory scholars as well. Absolutely brilliant. Because, but because she dared to speak the truth she and did. to complicate the analysis of how we see things, you know, she goes on to continue to teach, but she left that process. I almost want to say, if you were not going to support her all the way through, you should have never placed her name right. in the mouth. Right, right, right. And I think we forget about her. I also want to bring Anita Hill into this conversation. Yeah. Because I was I was just getting ready to bring that up. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. this was y'all, if y'all remember, this was right before Clarence Thomas was going to be confirmed, right? And so now we have this messy situation where we're like clean it up because this doesn't look good. But I want to submit to you, this is a this is an instance where we had a black man who put his interest before the health of this woman. And it wasn't just mm -hmm. Anita Hill, it was also this other woman. So she leaves the court with this like 
and like I don't want to tell you she goes into obscurity. She she continues to teach, but what what must that have been like? Like she didn't even want the movie made about her. She's like, don't bring this up again. And so we constantly see this. But here's where I want to like infuse hope into this conversation, understanding that the possibility of Christian cinema and whoever else um, that we say votes democratic, right? Don't get tricked by the labels at all. But the possibility of her not making it does not does not misalign her accomplishment or how brilliant she is. Right. I want I want us to understand we still need to show up the day after, regardless of what happens. Of course. We're not. History is not that long. We have seen this before, and she will continue to do amazing things. Do we want her to sit on the court? Absolutely. But even if she's not, she's still gonna be the bomb.com. Here she yes. is. <laughs> yes. So we are coming to, or we're actually a little bit past time. Um, what I'd like to do is just go around the table and have final thoughts. So let's start with Miss Evans and then Dr. Allen and then Dr. Hart. Oh, I'm not my mom. I'm not good at this. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I think that we should not try and live in white spaces. Um, but I don't mean to go out and, you know, become the Hulk and break everything. Cause then you're, you're just another, you're just another ancestor. What I mean is, is so at my office, they, they have a way of things where it's like, you have to do this. Like your desk has to look like this. I have a little knickknack, just a cute little black figurine of a Buffalo soldier. And they can't take that away from me. They can't because it's historically it's historically accurate. It's a part of the time, and I can I can talk about it with customers. So just having that little ounce of yourself be visible, be possible, and growing, and flourishing, I believe will do wonders for us right now, because I believe that the slap, I believe the congressional hearing and the actions taking of it, more is to come. And I feel like that slap was a, a kind of reckoning call where you can't keep pushing this down. You can't keep repurposing yourself over and over and over again generationally. Otherwise, there's going to be cracks in that world. And thank you, guys. Just th thank you so much. And I apologize, but I don't, I don't have anything else to, else to say on that matter right now. I just hope and feel that we can, we can love outside those white lines. Thank you very much. And just know that that was plenty. Your voice is significant and you contributed exactly what you needed to tonight. So thank you very Indeed. much. <laughs> Dr. Um, Allen? Yes. Okay, so what I want to say is, is this thing. I want us to complicate our analysis of situations, right? It can't just be the either or. The same way that you see us, um, <laughs> Dr. Hart and I don't see eye to eye. Destiny and I don't see eye to eye. Um, but we are willing to sit at a table and complicate an analysis. Like, hey, have you considered this? How, are we looking at this the wrong way? What if this doesn't happen? And I, that's what I would like to see more of. And for us to remove com um, um, words like it's just, right, from our conversations when we are talking, because it's just whatever follows that, whatever adjective follows that, is a way that shuts down conversations about who, what, and when gets to be human, who gets to, ex you know, um, 
have the full functionality of their emotions, who gets to be in spaces. And so that's what I would challenge people to do. When you feel the need to just be like, that's, that's just stupid. Well, why is it just stupid? And whose experience are you looking from that? Um, from Because without that, we will oversimplify situations that deserve more critical analysis. Dr. Hart? So um, I just want to say briefly that one of my favorite sheroes is Fannie Lou Hamer. And I love her quote, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired because that's how I feel. And I think this whole conversation is, is was you know, has tenets of what we all are sick and tired of, even though the hypocrisy of it all is it doesn't always give us the final end result of the evidence that lay before us, like Judge Brown, Judge Brown Jackson. And um, even with the slap gate, it's like, when does it end? It's, 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 it's just like this, we get piled on more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And we're supposed to try to figure it out. And this is three black women here having this discussion with um, all due respect to each other's objectives and interpretations and analysis and opinions, because we're different women. We, we've had different experiences. We're from different regions of the world and the country. And our, our narrative fits what we've experienced, what we know. But however, each one of you has opened up something that keeps me alert and wise and um, to be able to see it from another vantage point, which is critical to me, especially in the generational piece. Um, I'm not as old as you think or as I look, but I base everything I do and say based on my experiences and interactions and encounters with people, women, men, black, white, indigenous, and other, because that's the world that I've lived in for the last years or so of my life. And I look forward to um, the opportunity that this kitchen table talk gives us because it inspires us and it opens my mind to others' insightfulness and it encourages me to continue to be a voice because under this one umbrella, we're still voices for pockets of people that others overlook. So yeah, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, but I'm very happy to be a part of such rich dialogue that... Um, Miss Kahara House and Dr. Reverend Bernadine Lewis will not let go. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Amen. Ashe. 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 Thank you all for being part of this conversation. And I think you all struck on a very important point that I hope our audience takes from this is the beauty of coming together at the kitchen table or at the barber shop or wherever we are meeting and gathering in these different voices of different lived experiences to come to collective, not necessarily agreement, but at least understanding where we can come together and understand how our lived experiences contribute to our understandings of the world, of moments in this world, of how we are uh, united in combating systems of supremacy and racism and intolerance and hatred and XYZ and ABC and everything in between. We have power in coming in these moments and sharing our voices and sharing our differences along with where we agree and recognizing that it all has value. Yeah. And that, I think, is the point of the kitchen table. And I think that is the point of the Live Black Experience Dialogue series. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you to those who joined in this evening and watched and listened along. Um, I will admit in getting so caught up in the conversation, I was not following along with the chat as I usually do. And so I apologize to anyone who asked questions that I may have missed. I think we hit some of them during the, the course of the conversation, but uh, please know that it was not intentional to not hit your questions this evening. We just got into a, a very deep place and uh, I was just right there in that moment. So um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for always participating in these conversations and learning along with us. As we always say, we hope that you will come back next time, continue to join us for these conversations and until then, go in grace.